Hey everyone, Ryan here, and welcome back to our patient management series. In this video, we're going to talk about materials and equipment safety, which is intimately connected to our last video on infection control. So we're going to start by talking about mercury. Now, of course, amalgam is safe to use, but it's certainly not used as much as it once was due to increasing aesthetic concerns. But because mercury is a component of amalgam, it's important to be at least familiar with its material safety. So when dealing with mercury, inhalation is the biggest risk. If a spill does occur in the dental clinic, you use a special vacuum system and then apply a sulfur powder on the floor where the spill occurred. And the powder absorbs the elemental mercury, which makes it easier and safer to handle. Now, significant mercury exposure can lead to acute mercury toxicity, which includes the following symptoms, which can be brought up on the board exam. So these include muscle weakness or hypotonia, loss of hair, alopecia, weight loss and GI disorders, and this general feeling of tiredness and exhaustion. So there are various forms of airborne particles that occur and appear in the dental setting. Two definitions that I'd be familiar with are splatter and aerosols. Now splatter or spatter, they're both synonymous terms, involve visible drops of liquid. These are greater than or equal to 50 microns. They fall within three feet of the patient's mouth. So this is a, about one meter for all of you metric people out there, and this is known as the splatter area or splatter zone, where one meter diameter from the patient's mouth is where the splatter can uh, move to. And splatter, because it's visible liquid of a certain diameter, it can carry blood-borne pathogens like Hep B, Hep C, and HIV that we talked about in the last video. Now aerosols are invisible particles. These are less than 50 microns. And these, this also includes those droplet nuclei, which are less than 5 microns. So aerosols, because of their size, can remain floating in the air for hours but they're only able to carry respiratory infections. So this would be like tuberculosis or TB. Again, something we talked about in the last video. Now, the exact diameter measurements will be different depending on the source you look at, but I just like to keep it simple. So I like to just remember greater than 50, less than 50, and but the more important thing is to remember that splatter or the visible particles, aerosol, are the invisible particles. All right, noise control. This is something important to consider in the dental setting as well, because a lot of the instruments we use can be, well, fairly loud. And hearing loss develops slowly over time and can be caused by repeated exposures to greater than or equal to 90 decibel sounds. Now, there are other risk factors for hearing loss, but I'm talking about frequent chronic exposure to loud noises. And again, it's important uh, to note for us because dentists are exposed to the noise of hand pieces and ultrasonic scalers that can range from 60 to 100 decibels. So it's definitely something to think about. And if you're interested, this is a nice chart listing decibel level sounds from low to extremely, extremely loud. Water lines. So in the last video, I talked about the EPA, which is concerned with transport of materials in and out of the office. And in this case, water certainly fits the bill. So the Environmental Protection Agency requires less than or equal to 500 CFUs of heterotrophic bacteria per milliliter of water. So in microbiology, a CFU is a colony forming unit. And that's a unit used to estimate the number of viable bacteria or fungal cells in a sample of liquid. So the lower that number, essentially the safer and cleaner that water is. Now it's not recommended to flush lines at the beginning of clinic because it essentially makes no difference. But like we talked about in the infection control uh, video, remember to flush the ultrasonic for at least 20 to 30 seconds 
at the end of the day, or even better, between each patient. And you do this by connecting the scaler's water line to an air source, and then you run the scaler until all the water residue in the water line has been expelled. Anti-retraction valves, as used uh, uses part of the water system, are great because, as the name suggests, they prevent retraction of fluid from a patient into the handpiece, into the machinery, which could then be passed on to the next patient. So anti-retraction valves just helps keep the water nice and safe and nice and clean. All right, and lastly, we're gonna spend some time talking about the material safety data sheet, now just called the safety data sheet, or SDS for short. So this is probably the most important fact in this whole video. The SDS is a manual made by the manufacturer. The manufacturer is responsible for writing these directions, not OSHA. OSHA and other hazard communication standards like it require employers to provide employees with immediate access to these, these SDSs, for chemicals that they work with so they know specific hazards for these chemicals, how to deal with spills, like we were talking about with mercury before, etc. So that's what this, these safety data sheets are talking about, but they're made and prepared by the manufacturer and it's up to the employer to provide them to their employees. Okay, now that that's out of the way, let's talk about the actual components of a safety data, of a safety data sheet. So, the SDS uses the National Fire Protection Association color and number system, and here in the bottom right-hand corner is a great key to help understand what it means. So a standard hazard label lists the health hazards in blue, the flammability of the chemical in red, its reactivity in yellow, and any other specific hazards here in white. And the numbers go from zero to four, from least to most dangerous. So in this example, we have a health hazard of two, which is mildly hazardous, a flammability of four, which is incredibly flammable, a reactivity of one, which means it's fairly stable, but it, as it says here, unstable if heated. Of course, you don't have to remember all of these, just the general trend of what the numbers mean is, is, is just fine. And any specific hazards, in this case, this chemical happens to be an acid. So again, you don't have to remember what all these numbers means by, by no means do you have to know that, but just remembering maybe if you have any extra room what each of these colors refers to. But again, most likely, you're only gonna get one or two questions on this section on the board exam anyway, and it's most likely gonna be asking about the material safety data sheet being made by the manufacturer of the chemical. Now, I will give you bonus points if you know what this code is referring to and what chemical this is talking about. All right, so that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching, everyone. If you're interested in supporting the channel, please check out my Patreon page. A huge thank you to Michael Raja, Reb Boyd, Leonilla Bunger, David Jaden, Yannet, Nicole, Isabella Caldas, Ali Benjdeer, and all of my patrons for their support. You can unlock extras like access to my video slides to take notes on and practice questions for the board exams. So go check that out. The link is in the description. Thanks again for watching, everyone. I'll see you in the next video.